Hey guys, I uh, am going to be reviewing the Sonus Faber Sonetto 2 G2. My request to brands is when you name your speakers, if you can just label them like one, two, three, <laughs> makes my life a lot easier as a reviewer. Okay, uh, these speakers came from a viewer. They retail for about $27.50. And if you want to know some of the specs, here you go. They feature a one and one eighth inch damped apex dome, silk dome tweeter, a six and a half inch cone woofer. The base has a mixture of concrete, aluminum, and steel to allow for the speaker to be vented below the cabinet. Impedance is rated at four ohm, power handling at 30 to 200 watts. They are made in Italy, according to the manufacturer, and they weigh approximately 23 pounds each. They come in a few different colors. This light color walnut you see here, black, and this darker walnut. A few quick things when I talk about speaker distance from the wall, this is what I'm talking about. When I talk about aiming, this is what I'm talking about. And when I talk about room size, this is what I'm talking about. I think I could best sum up the sound of this speaker by saying it is not neutral, but it is not as bright as some other Sonus Faber speakers that I have listened to myself. Uh, basically, I'm really kind of confused by the Sonus Faber tonality signature. And they're not the only ones to have kind of a mixed bag when it comes to their tonal signature. There are brands that have a similar balance to their speakers, so you kind of have an idea of what to expect. Maybe they're all going to sound a little bit bright. Maybe they're all going to be a little bit neutral. Maybe they're all going to be a little bit warm. But some brands, such as Sonus Faber, kind of just, it, it's all over the place, okay? So the Sonus Faber Lumina 2 that I reviewed maybe like a year ago, that speaker was way bright. I mean, tear your ears off bright. If you like a neutral speaker like I do, if you like a warmer sounding speaker, maybe closer to what I like, I still prefer neutral, but I'll take warm. And you don't like what would be considered by some, at least maybe an analytical sound or a clinical sound or even high resolution or detailed, then Certainly the Lumina is not your choice because it's about two to five decibels higher than the Sonetto in the treble. But I would say that the Sonetto is probably not your choice either because it also has a boosted high frequency. Now, when we get to the data, I'm gonna provide you with some sound clips so you can judge for yourself just what you think. And I'll also show you some graphics that compare the two different Sonos Fobbers that I'm speaking of right now. But as a whole deal, I would say that if you like a sound that is a little bit elevated in the treble, maybe a little bit scooped out in the upper mid range, then this speaker is for you. Science from decades ago and even through current years tells us that most people prefer a more neutral sounding speaker. One that is flat on axis, anechoic, not in the room, huge difference. Flat on axis, anechoic with a nice falling off axis response, okay? Which means that Based on those subjective listening tests and the correlation with measurements, which I'll talk about in a little bit again, most people would prefer a more linear, more neutral sounding speaker than this one. But as I said, I'm getting tired of repeating myself. So I'm probably not gonna say that anymore. And I'm just gonna to try to describe to you what you can expect out of the speaker and hope that you understand that aspect of the science, okay? So again, you can expect a little bit of a dip in the upper mid range, which will come across as a slight lack of detail. It's gonna be a lack of attack and clarity and maybe not as extreme compared to the Lumina 2, but you also will have a little bit of a boosted top end, which could sound analytical, high resolution or detailed, okay? Those terms tend to be related to what we see in the frequency response. In my room, when I pointed these speakers straight at me, they're directly on axis, zero degrees, like that graphic earlier showed you, these things were too bright for me. So I walked over to them and I said, quit looking at me, <laughs> look the other way, turn them off axis, pointing straight out into the room. Doing that dropped the treble enough for me to not wince every time a hi-hat was hit or something like that, or, or somebody spoke and there wasn't too much sibilance. That definitely made a difference for me in my listening position. As far as placement from the wall, 
I think that this speaker needs a little bit more room to breathe if you don't have equalization to tame the bottom end a little bit, because as you place it closer to the wall, that 80 to 120 hertz region is gonna kind of stand out a little bit more. And certainly your room is going to dictate some more of that. You know, for example, I can have a speaker roll off starting at 100 hertz, but at around 40 hertz in my room, there's gonna be a big old bump right there because of a room mode. And that's basically all the sounds are correlating and they're saying, yo, come here. And this other one's like, all right, I'm on my way. And they go, and it goes through the roof at 40 hertz. And I'll always have to EQ that down because even though it may sound cool to have a lot of extra thump down there, it's very distracting. It's totally not natural. So with that in mind, I do suggest that you might wanna be prepared to pull this particular speaker out a little bit further from the wall if, especially if you're used to coming from maybe the Lumina 2, because the Lumina 2 will do a little bit better, a little bit closer to the wall. Now, how far am I talking about? I'm gonna say that's gonna depend on you. Again, room modes, okay? But if we're in a perfect world where there are no room modes and there is no rear wall bounce from the speaker to go to the wall to hit it and then come back forward and cancel out in the mid range, if we are in an ideal world, then I would say about two feet is probably where you wanna be for this particular speaker, maybe one and a half feet from the back of the speaker to the wall behind it, okay? So that gets aiming and that gets positioning in the room off the wall. Now, what about sidewalls? This speaker has very good directivity, certainly horizontally, okay? Maybe the vertical is a little bit of a mismatch. So it means that you need to put your ears pretty much level with the tweeter position vertically. But as far as reflections off the sidewalls, the dispersion of the speaker narrows up as it goes higher in frequency. I tend to prefer a speaker that doesn't necessarily narrow. I like something that's a little bit more constant, but I would take narrowing versus something that narrows and then broadens and then narrows again, because what happens is when it narrows and broadens, usually that's at the crossover. Usually that's around like two to four kilohertz, depending on the speaker. And usually that means the speaker is gonna sound hella bright and very sibilant most of the time and very forward. Okay, there's different ways that you could describe it. That's how I would describe that phenomenon. Phenomena, phenomenon. As far as room treatments go, I do not recommend room treatment for this speaker as far as the sidewalls go. The reason I say that, and, and take note, I'm distinctly talking about sidewall treatment for the speaker. Now, if your room is very echoey, very boomy, resonant, whatever, then certainly do whatever treatment you need for the room. But I would not treat the room for this particular speaker by adding sidewalls absorption. And the reason I say that goes back to the horizontal radiation, which means that it's pretty nice and linear. Although it's narrowing up, it's doing so at a pretty constant rate. It's not perfect. It's not like it's wave guided, but I was actually pretty impressed by that aspect. And that means that the reflections that are bouncing off the wall will sound similar in timbre to the direct sound, which means that you don't necessarily have to use sidewall absorption for this speaker, like you might if you use one of the speakers that I described earlier, where it narrows up and then it widens out and then the lower treble, upper mid range, and then it narrows again. That would be a speaker that you would want some sidewall absorption for. And I talk about that from time to time in other reviews. So just kind of keep your ear out for that or your mind or your temple. Now we're gonna blitz the data. But before I do that, what I'm gonna do is provide you a sound clip that uses pink noise first, and then I take that impulse response from the anechoic measurement, and I will convolve that with a pink noise. So you're listening to the original recording, it's not a recording of the speaker in my room, the original recording, and then the convolution that will mimic the anechoic on-axis sound of the speaker. And the whole goal here isn't to figure out, is this the speaker that I want? But it's just to relay to you the sound difference from the original to what the speaker is doing to the original. Okay, so let's go. That bit of information and all seceding, good Lord, additional information, we'll call it that, will be used 
via capture from my Clipple Nearfield scanner. It is a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows me to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic environment and present to you all this data to help you make a decision and help you understand how do I need to aim the speaker? How far off the wall should I put it? Where should I sit? All that stuff. The first thing we're going to look at is the frequency response. Now, this ties directly to what you just heard. Sensitivity is about 86.8 decibels, but pay attention. Around 700 hertz, you've got a resonance. And then the treble region is boosted by about one and a half to two decibels at certain areas. But overall, what you probably heard, at least this is what I heard. I heard some of the boosted treble, but mostly what I heard is in this area. And this area is the sound that tends to be uh, more forward. And usually when I say forward, I'm talking like one to 2K, but I would say maybe forward in this area. Uh, hollow and nasally are the words that I would use subjectively to ascribe to what we see in the measurements. The CEA 2034 data set shows us similar to what we just looked at. Same thing on axis frequency response in black. And then down here, I wanna pay attention to some of the directivity. Now we see some directivity issues around 1.2 and around 1.6 kilohertz. I'm not sure what's going on. My guess is that there is some sort of resonance in it. It might be from the port. I don't know exactly. I would have to dive into the speaker more, probably disassemble it to know for sure. And I'm not gonna do that to somebody else's speaker unless they give me free reign. And honestly, I just don't have time for that right now. And really what matters is what we hear and then what the data goes and shows with that. So I'm gonna move up the chain to the area where we have the handoff between the tweeter and the mid-range, which is gonna be around three kilohertz or so, right in this area. And that actually looks pretty good. Normally what I would see here is a big swing right through here, and that would be a pretty bad design, but this dot design looks good. I think they, they might be using higher order crossovers than other speakers in this typical size class. This is the estimated in-room response, and this is the line kind of drawing what I heard in the room. In-room extension to about 50 hertz, a nasally sound due to this resonance around 700 hertz or so. And then I would say bright or sibilant due to the in-room response, okay? If you tow the speaker 30 degrees, you're gonna reduce that sibilance. And that's what I did in my room. That reduced it by about a decibel, but it actually seemed like it did more uh, in reducing that sibilance. So that's what I would recommend. Burst decay, there's a long decay around 800 to 1600 hertz. So this may tie back to this region right here. There may be some port resonance or something of that nature going on. The horizontal contour, which this is what I was talking about earlier when I said speakers narrowing. This is the graphic that I use to, to help me determine what is the speaker doing as it spreads and radiates the sound, okay? Now, a constant sound or constant directivity would be where I just draw a flat line. In this case, we're narrowing up, and this is pretty typical, but I like that it does better than most. Others might come out through here and just flare out. And that's where you would really need absorption panels on the side to capture that flaring out. But this speaker and this lighter shade of red at about negative six decibels indicates that the directivity of the speaker is pretty good. Now, certainly there are a couple little quips here and there, but for the most part, the speaker's balance looks pretty good to me. It's about 60 degrees plus or minus through the mid range. So it will sound nice and spacious, but it won't sound as spacious as something like maybe a ribbon tweeter or something of that nature. Vertical contour plot, this tells us you better be sitting on that tweeter level or just above or below it, but do not exceed about 10 to 15 degrees. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels and then at 96 decibels. Multitone distortion, it's okay. Uh, just hitting this 3% through the mid range, but depending on the music that you're listening to and your own ears, I'm gonna say probably not immediately noticeable unless you're trying really hard and you have something to A, B compare it against. If you use a subwoofer, you lower that mid-range distortion. Dynamic range looks good for the speaker, okay? So on the low end, yeah, we're losing some output at about 102 decibels, but from 76 to 96 decibels in this blue, this thing has a good bit of dynamic range. The impedance shows a resonance in the cabinet around 400 hertz. And then we can also see the minimum impedance is about 4.2 ohms. So it shouldn't be a terribly hard speaker to drive. If you have access to equalization, this is what I recommend you doing, okay? Enter these bands of EQ in. This is the frequency, this is the level, and then this is the Q. Enter those in, you'll go from having this blue line estimated in-room response to this red line. A real fast comparison to the Lumina 2. As I said, the Lumina 2 is about two to five decibels hotter. The Lumina 2 can probably go a little bit closer to the wall. Lumina 2 has a much more non-linear 
horizontal radiation pattern. That's an example of a speaker that goes narrow and then wides out and then goes narrow again. The Lumina 2 has not quite as full bass as the Sonetto. The Lumina 2 has higher distortion and higher compression or lower dynamic range. And this is just a graphic to quickly show you the overlay. That does it for this review. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, let me know in the comment section below. I'll try to answer them. This isn't my day job. Can't guarantee that I will. If you like what you see and you would like to support what I'm doing here, you can do so a few different ways. One is you can buy a t-shirt through my merch store below if you want to do that. That'd be kind of cool. You can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner where I will post behind the scenes information, sneak peeks, updates, do polls, and sometimes giveaways. Or you can use any of my generic affiliate links in the description section below. So for example, let's say tomorrow you've got to order, I don't know, oatmeal from Amazon, okay? Just remember, hey, go to my videos, click the Amazon generic affiliate link, and then go buy the oatmeal or whatever else you need to buy. All right, I'll talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.